All right, everybody. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the show. So political debates have been something that uh, have always happened in federal elections. And tonight will be the uh, English language leaders debate, uh, the only one of this election, I do believe. And uh, last night was the French debate. And so what kind of an impact do debates have on the final outcome of the election? Uh, here to help us find out and to uh, ask these questions is Deb Matthews. She's the former Deputy Premier of Ontario. David Mosscrop is a contributing columnist at the Washington Post. He's also the author of a book titled Too Dumb for Democracy, and he's the host of Open for Debate. Tonda McCharles is an Ottawa-based parliamentary reporter for the Toronto Star, and Lucas Meyer is a senior consultant for media and public affairs with Enterprise Canada. Uh, it's good to have everybody here today. Uh, so Tonda, I'll start off with you. Uh, the French debate took place uh, last night. So maybe I'll just start off with how big of an impact do you think uh, the French debate will have on Quebec voters? Uh, I'm not too uh, I'm not too sure how many people outside of Quebec watched the debate, um, but obviously the French debate was mainly to uh, try and help Quebec voters decide. So how big of an impact do you think that will have on the final results in Quebec? Well, look, I think I think it's important to realize that was the third big encounter um, that the Quebecers got to see and, and Francophones got to see these leaders. So they had a big series of roundtable interviews last week at the beginning. And then there was also another private sector debate. And there was a um, uh, the consortium big media debate last night. Um, I think that already, certainly when I talk to uh, liberals and conservatives, uh, they feel that, you know, their guy didn't lose, put it that way. Um, and I think we're seeing some interesting things happen in Quebec right now because the Conservatives not only got a bit of a boost from the fact that Aaron O'Toole survived a French language debate without a major gaffe and was not the target of attacks like Andrew Scheer was, um, but he also got the Conservatives and Aaron O'Toole got a huge boost today after the French debates and heading into the English language debate tonight by the Quebec Premier coming out guns blazing in support of the Conservatives. Okay, and uh, Deb, I'll ask you the next question. You were uh, previously an elected official in the um, Ontario Parliament, so it's good to get your insight on this. So what do you think Justin Trudeau has to do to, you know, when prior to the call of the election, he had uh, a lead of, uh, in some polls, uh, let's say by Abacus, he had uh, nearly a 10-point lead, and in some polls even bigger than that. Um, and now we see that the race is tightening and in some polls and the majority of polls um, even now have the conservatives ahead. And so um, do you think it's even possible for Justin Trudeau to go back to that size of a lead? And uh, and just how do you what steps do you think he has to take to go back to any sort of, of a lead in the polls? So I, I think we're in for a heck of a couple of weeks. Um, this uh, this election is just now, I think, starting to. Uh, take some get people are now started to pay attention. I think there are some really big wedge issues that did come up last night. The number one, I think, is childcare. And you know, Aaron O'Toole is now saying we will scrap ten dollar a day childcare. That's going to impact a lot of people, not just people with small children, but people like me who have grandchildren. I think that, that universal childcare affordable, regulated is, is a huge step forward for Canada and for Aaron O'Toole to so blatantly say it's gone. Um, I think the other big issue is the one you asked Justin Trudeau about in Cambridge, and that is the environment. And I think people who really will vote based on that, and there are some, or there are many, I think, they will see that um, that the Liberal plan is the best plan. And so so I guess to answer your question, I think it's now time to really draw a distinct difference between Aaron O'Toole and, and Justin Trudeau. Okay, David, uh, I'll go to you next. In the 2019 official debates, many people said that um, Jagmeet Singh won the debate. And, and even for the people that didn't say he won, they, the majority of people would be willing to admit that he did perform fairly well in those debates. So why do you think many people um, believe that he was did well in the debates? And, and how do you think he can uh, repeat that and, and do well in tonight's debate as well? Well, I think first and foremost, it's because he's authentic and people like him. I mean, it's hard to 
underestimate the effect of uh, or the impact of simply liking a politician. I mean, we're used to having sort of mixed feelings at best about politicians and sometimes disliking them. It seems like the more people get to know Jagmeet Singh, the more they like him. And that's, that's a huge asset. The question is, can you convert that likability, that trustability into votes? That's a different thing. And you saw the NDP in, in 2019 and were able to do that a little bit, but not a ton. This time around, the question remains. I mean, can you translate that popularity into votes? Can you translate being good on TikTok into votes? Can you translate into a lot of 18 to 26 year olds, 18 to 34 year olds liking you into votes, especially when they tend to be a group that turns out a little bit, and in fact, sometimes quite a bit less often than older voters. In fact, if you look at the 18 to 24 age range and the 55 plus age range, you see like a 20 point, sometimes almost a 30 point spread in turnout. So the question is, how do you then mobilize that? Uh, this time around, I think he's got to just continue to be himself and continue to push back against uh, both Aaron O'Toole and Justin Trudeau to provide a kind of credible alternative to what will be seen as a sort of two party duopoly. Uh, now, that's what you got to push for. And I'll also, and, and to look distinct from them, the counterpoint is you also have to guard against. Uh, Justin Trudeau scaring liberals or, or fence sitting progressives into voting for the red team because they're scared of the blue team. And that's going to be awfully difficult to do no matter who you are, because if we get to election day and there's a couple of points between the liberals and the Tories, there's always a risk that that uh, soft progressives go home and, and there's not a ton you can do about that. So he's he's working with what he's got, but uh, I'm not convinced it's going to translate to a massive boost, although you might see him pick up as much as a dozen seats, which you know, if the NDP ends up with 36 seats, that's not a bad day. All right, Lucas, and perhaps I'll ask you about this because David mentioned it a little bit, but um, more so on the left. But to talk about it a little bit on the right in terms of uh, vote splitting for the Conservatives, we've seen a poll, I believe it was by Main Street or maybe Ecos, I'm not sure. Um, but I believe it had the People's Party at nearly 10 percent of the vote, which uh, is a very significant amount. And if you think about it, obviously not um, all of all of the People's Party supporters were previous conservative supporters. A lot of them, uh, and I've seen somebody saying that uh, a lot of previous Green supporters went to the People's Party um, because of their stance on, on vaccination. So just how big of an impact do you think uh, the People's Party will have on the election? And, and do you think they could actually be what prevents Aaron O'Toole from, from winning government? Excellent question. Um, well, the thing that why it was, there's this old saying with predictions, it's that predictions are really, really hard to make, especially about the future. Uh, <laughs> a couple, few years ago, I mean, when Maxime Bernier was, first of all, involved in the debates, um, there was a lot of suspicion or, or prediction that he was going to retain his seat and then ended up not doing that. Now, a lot can change in two years, obviously. Um, and what Aaron O'Toole has done very, very tactically, obviously, is that he's, he's changed a lot from when he was running for the leadership of the Conservative Party versus what he is now. If you go back and look at some of those, um, those, those er when he was running against Peter McKay to take over the Conservatives, uh, you could tell that there was certainly a lot of appeal to some of those, those right, far right leaning voters with sort of aggressive music and, and, and imagery and um, talking about that take Canada back aspect and fighting for our values. That has very, very carefully softened. Um, and he's trying to be more uh, open. He's trying to be more uh, appealing to a wider range of voters, especially those kinds of center right voters. And so that is a signal to, I can tell you to a lot of, uh, of those on the far right, that it's sort of a, a change in the type of candidate and the type of potential prime minister that Peter, that, excuse me, that Aaron O'Toole could be. So when you look at the, the idea that it could have an impact on him potentially not becoming prime minister, I, I, I don't see it having that much of an impact, even on some of the polls that you mentioned, because you have to distinguish between the amount of popular vote versus the amount of seats that could potentially uh, be gained. However, that being said, um, what we're seeing right now with the PPC, especially uh, with, the, with, with, with their attempts to type of take advantage of the type of hostility and anger, specifically around the pandemic and those types of those, those, those debates, if you want to call them around freedoms and, and what we do around vaccinations and mandates, et cetera, it sort of pushed that far right voice um, much closer into um, our, our sort of our perception, our voting atmosphere, if you will. And so that's something that, that Aaron O'Toole has to consider, but he's, he's made his decision. He has decided the type of candidate that he wants to be. 
And um, in terms of those casual voters or people who are seeing him, for example, tonight during the debates, they're, they're probably not going to identify with him as someone who might be um, with the liberals would accuse him of, of trying to you know, dog whistle to that kind of far right element uh, of the base. Um, so I, I, I think it would be a hard stretch to say that it would cost him anything overly significant. But that being said, the rise that we're seeing from the People's Party is something that we that nobody, I think, should should avoid. OK, Tonda, what about I mean, the conservatives and uh, Aaron O'Toole? Um, well, first of all, the conservatives in in 2019, they had a lead in the polls to start with. And then mm -hmm. um, as the election continued to. Uh, progress the liberals took over and the liberals were ahead by a very small margin um, on election day and and it seems like that could end up being the case here we've seen um, yeah. you know a week ago there were polls coming out by main street and ecos that uh, at one point the highest main street had was a 10 uh, percent lead for the conservatives now main streets uh, margins are decreasing as well so what do you think Aaron o'toole has to do to basically not repeat the same mistakes that andrew Shear made well, he's already uh, not made some of the mistakes that Andrew Scheer made, which were, uh, for example, not um, put forward a clear uh, stance on a hot button issue that is abortion. Um, he's put some of that to bed. He has made a few other mistakes in not providing enough clarity on, for example, firearms. And I think that will still be an issue when Aaron O'Toole wants to appeal to voters in and around the GTA and in and around the greater Vancouver area. So what Aaron O'Toole has to keep doing is show people he's not Justin Trudeau, show people he's not Andrew Scheer or Stephen Harper, and continue to carve out what he's been doing since the beginning, which is presenting himself very strategically in a very disciplined way as um, someone who is not, you know, in quotation marks, scary, the scary conservative that Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh may want to portray him as. Jagmeet Singh, though, is not doing that. He's not casting uh, Aaron O'Toole as the big bad, big bad boogeyman. He's focusing solely on Justin Trudeau. So Aaron O'Toole kind of has to hope that he's able to keep a bunch of his candidates under control not let those who are unvaccinated get out and start spouting off why they're not un unvaccinated and continue to look like a moderate, sensible choice for Canadians. That's his job. That's what he wants to do. Can he achieve it? We'll see. Okay, Deb, and uh, you were a former provincial minister in the uh, Kathleen Wynne government. You were a deputy premier. Um, and so obviously Ontario is, uh, is a very big prize in uh, Canadian election. You kind of have to uh, when you obviously have to win a lot of the seats in Ontario uh, in order to win. And so what do you think Justin Trudeau has to do to hang on to ridings like uh, like Oakville, uh, London North Centre, I believe, is now competitive for uh, the NDP in that riding, maybe? Uh, and so what do you, what do you believe that uh, Justin Trudeau has to do to maintain some of those uh, GTA ridings that he currently holds? So I, I think he needs to present a positive... Um, uh, profile of what he wants to accomplish. I think, I think that um, actually I, I disagree with with what was said earlier about the rise of uh, of the People's Party not being significant. I think when you get into numbers, you know, ten percent, uh, and they're not evenly distributed, but those are those are going to take votes away from the Conservatives, no doubt about it, which creates that split um, uh, split vote, which which will be good for the Liberals. But I also think Erdo O'Toole has, I think being leader of the Conservative Party in Canada is almost an impossible job because the tent that they've created includes a lot of people on the far right. He won the leadership because he took those positions pro-gun. He was, had the right to life people with him. He had some big IOUs out there from the leadership. And now he knows that's not popular with the public, it might be popular with the party, but not the public. And he's, I, I think he's got the impossible task of trying to figure out where he stands on those issues. And I think he's, he's not, he's not, he's not being authentic, right? Like it's hard to believe what he says because last week he said something different. So, um, you know, I think he's got a really tough, tough job to do. And uh, I think Justin has to maintain that upbeat, optimistic, um, all over the country um, approach to campaigning. He's very, very good at it. 
Okay, and uh, we are a little bit over our time now, so I'll ask two more questions, but try to make your answer short. So, uh, Lucas, the Conservatives have always struggled to uh, win seats in the GTA. What do you think Aaron O'Toole has to do to, to gain his seat count in the GTA uh, and, and gain some current ridings that have Liberal incumbents? Kind of the, the same question I just asked Deb, but reversed and said uh, now for the Conservatives. I think I would actually touch base a little bit on what Tonda mentioned before. I mean, th the fact that he's been able to kind of avoid the, the, the problems that plague the conservatives back in 2018 is already sort of working in his favor. Um, and there's, there was a very interesting thing that the, uh, that the board camp and Justin Trudeau's camp had about kind of having a pact of non-aggression because some of those, those swing writings are incredibly important. Um, I, what he has to be careful of, I think, is around child care, because and that's something that you should expect that was, is definitely going to come out, especially after his platform came yeah. out yesterday. He faced a lot of questions on that yesterday. A again, you, you make decisions here, Wyatt, on when you release your platform and how it's costed. Uh, obviously, they wanted to do it at this particular time. Expect a lot of questions on child care because that is going to be on the minds of a, a lot of parents who live in those suburban ridings in Ontario. So childcare is going to be critical. He has to be able, if he wants to gain a lot of those votes, to kind of put those concerns at ease. Um, that's going to be critical for him. And then obviously, um, what he's going to do around healthcare. I mean, obviously, coming out of the COVID recovery, um, how we're going to get people back to work, how we're going to kind of have a stable economic recovery is going to be critical. And 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 if he can hit those, uh, if he can hit those correct notes, that's going to be important for him. And if he can't, um, if voters are going to look at what Justin Trudeau has been doing for the last six years and decide, well, you know, I, I've, I've seen what they did during the pandemic. I had my vote there before. This is what I'm going to go with. Uh, you know, that's it, it, to Deb's point. Aaron O'Toole is in a very difficult um, uh, position. Um, and those are the types of issues that he has to he's going to face tonight. and He's going to have to face during the rest of the campaign. All right, David. And uh, super quickly. Um, so the Greens and Annamie Paul admitted last night in her uh, post debate conference that the internal turmoil has caused the party uh, to lose some uh, support. Mm. I remember it kind of being a bit of a shock when I heard that because uh, for months of, you know, her doing interviews and stuff, she kind of um, didn't even necessarily acknowledge she acknowledged the internal turmoil, but she didn't necessarily acknowledge the fact that it would have an impact on her party in the election. Uh, so, so how big of a success can the Greens have in this election? And and just more specifically, how do you think the Greens will define success in this election? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, it, it was a shame that Annamie Paul wasn't given the chance to lead her party from day one. She won the yep. leadership. She earned the chance to, to run that party. And, and the party tried to take it, a faction within the party tried to take it away from her. And we saw last night in the consortium French debate that she has a lot of capacity on the debate stage and has a lot to say and fills an important role on that stage uh, that, that other folks can fill. And incidentally, also fills roles that they can. So she's got a lot of range and she's and she's a force. So I, I think that's going to help uh, the Greens. I think last night will have helped them. I think tonight will help them too. The country will get to know the Greens and Paul a little bit better than they did before. Probably didn't know her all, at all before, incidentally. And, and that will probably save them a little bit. I suspect they're going to define success as winning between one and three seats. Uh, certainly, if they can get three seats, that's a good day. They're going to want to certainly hold on to Elizabeth May's seat and, and ideally Paul Manley's seat. They've got a bit of, sh of a shot in Kitchener now that they didn't necessarily have before because the Liberals are down a candidate and they've got a bit of a machine in Kitchener. So uh, I think what they've got to do is focus on the ridings they can win. That's a handful of them. They've got, it doesn't matter what the national numbers look like for them, if they can focus on, you know, two or three ridings, which they can do, and that's a good day for them. The question will be, if, if Paul loses her seat, which seems probable, or sorry, if she fails to win the seat in Toronto Centre, which seems probable, will she stay on as leader? Uh, I certainly hope that she will, because it's an unreasonable expectation to think that not winning that seat means she's got to go. But I think that's going to be the next big question for the Greens, uh, wh whether or not they get one, two or three seats. All right, uh, David Mosscrop, Deb Matthews, Lucas Meyer, and Tonda McCharles, thank you all for joining me, and it's been great chatting with all of you. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to watching the debate, as I'm sure all of you do as well. You're awesome, Wyatt. Thanks for having us. Great <laughs> job, Wyatt. Thanks, man. Hey. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, all.